Today's sources include Witchcraft and Superstitious Record in the Southwestern District of Scotland by J. Maxwell Wood, Witchcraft and Second Sight in the Highlands and Islands of Scotland by John Gregerson Campbell, and Scottish Herbs and Fairy Lore by Ellen Everett Hopman. For the intro bit, I would have loved to use the song Little Ghost by the White Stripes, but unfortunately copyright is something that exists. Bees are sacred to all Europeans, or at least were at some point. In the Baltic, this tradition is maintained and bees are held in high regard above other animals though remnants of their esteem can be found elsewhere. In Scotland, when someone passes away, the family would tell the bees, since the bees are the messengers of the gods. The hive would also be draped in a black cloth to show that the bees were in mourning. In every culture on earth, death is understandably held in great significance and has a number of customs, rituals, and superstitions associated with it persisting even today, albeit to a lesser prevalence of actual believers, is the concept of a ghost or spectre. Common to the southwest of Scotland is the wraith. The wraith is a ghostly apparition of a person signifying their death to their loved ones, though the wraith is peculiar amongst apparitions in that it, it appears before and not after death. It is easily mistaken for the actual person. It is best described and understood by tales of their appearances. All of these are said to be real accounts. Those reporting them surely believe them to have been true. The following stories were written in thick Scottish dialect, so in a lot of cases I had difficulty understanding what was written and I had to flip through a Scots dictionary to translate. For the sake of the video, I will paraphrase it into more familiar words. In the 1820s, there was an old man. He looked out his window to see his son, Wooly, who was away for the week, 12 miles away as the crow flies. He was walking up the path to his daughter Margaret's home with a queer-drawn look about his face. Surprised to see his son, and startled by the look on his face, he went over his, to his daughters and asked, What brings Wooly home now, and where is he gone? God's sake, father, what are you talking about? There's no Wooly here, she responded, startled, having not seen Wooly. But I saw him come round the houses, and he had a queer-drawn look about his face that nearly flayed me. I hope nothing has happened to him. He looked at the clock and saw that it was ten to noon. That night, a messenger arrived with the sad news that Wooly had fallen into a ditch and then into a river, seriously injuring him before drowning and this had happened at around 10 to noon that day. Another similar such account of a wraith sighting involves a lady called Miss G. She did have more letters in her surname, but we don't get to know what they are. She had a neighbor who lived about a half mile away. She was setting out to go meet her when she saw her coming over, so she returned to her home to accept her. After a bit of time, her friend did not arrive, and she looked all around, but she was nowhere to be seen. Since it had gotten somewhat late, she decided she'd postpone the visit to the next morning. When she arrived at her friend's, she asked her, I saw you coming my way yesterday, what made you turn around? But her friend said, I can assure you I was not, for I was scarce from my own fireplace the whole day. A week later, Miss G's neighbor and friend was dead and her coffin was carried over the very route that her wraith had walked a week prior.
The following passage was written so Scottishly that I had to look up about three words per sentence to understand what was happening. So I have a, prepared a paraphrased text that is more or less entirely altered from the original. A boy recounted the events of his holiday. I went away to my uncle's, or rather my grandfather's, to stop a week or two, play myself among the moorhills, catch trouts, and learn two or three tunes on the flute. Well, I had not been there a long time when I saw as queer a thing as I have ever seen or might ever see. I'm out of the houses at morning at about eight o'clock, and a bonny harvest morning it was. Well, you see, I'm making a willow rod for myself, to take down to, with me to a deep pool that was to the brim with trout. And this I was going to do after breakfast, for I had not yet got my oats. Well, you see, I'm tying my rod together with a bit of wax thread, when by the houses comes my old grandfather with his staff. That he had with him in one hand, and in the other was his old mitten, which he had not yet put on. He came close by me and did a kind of look at what I'm doing, what I was doing, and then led himself away along the hip of the other hill to check how the cows were doing and the two young foals, as was typical of him. Well, away he went, I was so busy that when he went by I never spoke to him, and neither did he to me. I began to think about this when I was more at leisure, so I took a look at the road he took just to see how he was doing, since he was nearly eighty. Yet a fierce old man he was. So I took a, l a look, as I was saying, along the light over the hill, and I did see him wobbling away by the back side of the old willow locks. And in some time, maybe no more than ten minutes later, I stepped back inside to get some gin and a cup or two of oats, and then back off to the trouts, and who was sitting by the saddle stone smoking a pipe, but old grandfather. Lord preserve me, said I, and I said no more. I gazed in awe. What's wrong with the boy, quoth my auntie? Come out, quoth I, and I'll tell you, which I did. We went up the hill a bit, to be sure, and she said what she had seen she had never before. That night grandfather grew ill, which was on a Saturday, and he was dead by six o'clock on Monday. At Dunragan, Monavy, as curious an instance happened in the 1860s. The father of a schoolboy sat by the fireside with his wife. He saw his son return to the house early. The wife, skeptical, look, looked inside to find that he was not there. The father then became quite worried, but despite his wife's reassurances, and that night their son's body was brought to them. A writer recording their family history in the early 20th century recounted how in 1820 a young girl who would one day be the writer's paternal grandmother was returning home at night. She had never gave much of a thought into anything supernatural when she was met by a pale, white, noiseless figure. It then ran through a fence, not jumping or climbing over it, but passing through it. In absolute terror, the girl fled the rest of the way home and collapsed on the kitchen floor. Three days later, she learned that on that very night her brother was lost at sea. Another peculiar death superstition found in the highlands and islands of Scotland is the troubling notion of the warning. A warning is a sound heard at the sick chamber or otherwise with no natural explanation. They are a sign that death is near. Warnings take many forms. Scraping sounds at the window, typically thrice heard, is perhaps the most common. Paintings falling without parent, apparent cause, or footsteps within the house, or gravel crunching outside, but when you open the door, nothing is there. Clocks will stop at the time that your spirit passes. Further warnings include a mouse squeaking behind a bed, a raven flying over the house, or a rooster crowing at midnight and ringing in the ears. If a dog howls at night, 
or shies away from a sick person, or barks three times, or if a crow or a magpie lands on the roof, it may be a death omen. The death of a child is foretold if a flock of sparrows stays near the house, or if three meadow pipits sing near the house. Other omens include the dead drop, which is sounds of water droplets, and also unexplained knockings, or if a coffin-shaped coal leaps out of the fire, the ticking of a woodworm, and the songs of quails or rails croaking in a field, or the songs of ravens and crows on or around the roof of a house are also warnings. To dream of a ship sailing over dry land, or when both ends of a rainbow fall between the borders of a single township, it means death is likely. If a wife washes her husband's trousers in a stream and they fill with water, death is near. This one I don't really understand because I couldn't really imagine a scenario where washing your trousers in a stream wouldn't involve them filling with water. Individual families have unique warnings that tell them when a member of the clan is about to cross over. When a brettle bane is about to die, a bull will roar at night. The McLaughlins will see a small bird. Other families might hear whistling or see lights. Or in some cases, the air turns cold and screams and sobs are heard. A shooting star may be seen above the house where death will occur and it will lead towards the graveyard where that person will be buried. Another similar such death warning is the phenomenon known as dead lights. Uh, dead lights are phosphorescent glows in the forest which warn of a near death and can reveal the location of a murder victim. Uh, this is something different. Uh, but I guess you could say it's similar to the Will-O-Wisp. In the parish of Tunron, this mysterious light illuminated the whole interior of a byre where a woman was milking cows, and afterwards she learned that her mother had died the same evening. Other expressions of a similar nature are the dead spill, or... Deed spall, but I guess it's dead spill if you're being if you're speaking English, uh, which is the melted wax dripping onto the candle dish in a circle, and continually dripped in the direction of one person in particular, even when they moved. This was supposed to indicate the approaching hand of death. It's sort of like spin the bottle or Russian roulette, but less exciting. I should also like to mention Hugh of the Little Head, or Eorena Hinvik, uh, which was another such warning peculiar to the McLaughlins of Lochbury in Mull. It was, best, it was the best known and most dreadful specter in the West Highlands, the Phantom of a Headless Horseman, which made its appearance whenever any of the McLeans uh, drew near to death. The spectral horseman is mounted on a small black steed having a white spot on its forehead, and the marks of the hooves of which are not like those of other horses, but rather round indentations as if it had wooden legs. Whenever any of the clan which it follows are on their deathbed, Hugh is heard riding past the house, and sometimes he even shows himself at the door. He does not sit straight on the horse's back, but rather somewhat to one side. The following passage talks about wraiths and warnings and other such occurrences, and it's written very Scottishly, as all of these passages. So perhaps this will give you a taste of what I had to decipher for this video. I apologize for the accent, but there's kind of no other way to do it. Oft his wraith had been seen gliding among the meal sacks of the spence, till the house folk scarce could buy them, terrified most of the sense. Neath his head the death watch tinkled, constant as the lapse of time. Frey his bed the dead light twinkled, we as blue and sulphurous flame. Neath the bed the old body scraped, 
a day thrang as thrang could be, made a hole, say grave like shape it, folk glowered, quaking into sea. On the dreary kirkyard road, I, by night he raised such elder cows, wheel he kenned his master's body, soon mix among the mouths. Fray the wattles, deedrap spattered, at the canless dead spells hung, Piet rave the thrack and chattered, in folks' lugs the death bell rang. Hopefully that wasn't too terrible, um, but I thought that was kind of a cool um, poem, and it just gives you a good kind of taste of the way this was written and the kind of thing I had to um, work out when making this. Um, I, I, you know, I, I think I already mentioned, but I, I would flip through like a Scots dictionary because Scots is technically a different language than English. It's the closest language to English, but it's actually a different language, Scots. Like, you can look up the Scots language, and it'll be like... It just seems like he's talking with a thick Scottish accent, and then suddenly he'll say a whole bunch of words that it's like you've... You have no idea what he's saying because he's not speaking English. Um, so, it's technically... It's, some people consider it a dialect, but it's technically a different language than English. Um... You know, some of these words like fray and um, thrang and scrape it instead of scraped. Uh, it's very, um, it's very much from the Scots language. Um, in that second source I listed at the beginning by John Gregerson Campbell, uh, it was published in 1902. Much of what he discusses in that book, be it fairies, ghosts, magic witches, or otherwise, was gathered from the century before him. When he tells stories from the 1860s, it's sort of like us talking about the 1980s. To him, these stories were not from the so distant past, and those superstitions, as he called them, persisted to his time. It's been said that if Belief is called belief is called a religion if it's organized, folklore if you respect it, and a superstition or fairy tales if you do not. Um, at the time he wrote the book, much of Scot Scotland and Ireland was rural and poor. The Industrial Revolution happened earlier in England, after all. When discussing, when discussing the beliefs of these regions, he has this attitude that the people holding th these beliefs were essentially hillbillies, country bumpkins that he didn't have much respect for. Though, if it has to be said that if he didn't take an interest in the folklore, he wouldn't have dedicated his life to its preservation by recording it as extensively as he did. Either way, I found it interesting how his biases showed in his writing. He would remark that the Celts were superstitious by nature, and that anything that couldn't be rationally explained without an understanding of modern science, or modern 118 years ago anyway, would immediately and unquestioningly be assigned to the supernatural. In his defense, that is essentially what was happening. The difference is I don't scoff at it because I have somewhat of a romanticized view of the past. Um... I just thought I'd I just thought I'd mention that because um, it's just interesting to me his perspective because it was a different world than we exist in now, and I sort of look back at this old lore with this sort of uh, wonderment, but um, that's not necessarily how people saw it. You know, a hundred years ago when they were recording it, um, this John Gregerson Campbell, you know these people out in the country believing in fairies and brownies and all that, it's something like how we might view someone who looks believes in Bigfoot today. So I, I just found that to be kind of interesting, because it never occurred to me. Um, I don't have a great way to end this. So thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.